Hello and welcome to a revision of linear regression. My name is Danny and I'm going to be taking you through today's revision. So let's first of all start with the basics of what we need to go through in linear regression. The first step is to look at the univariate followed by the bivariate, then to look at the linear regression output check the model, assess the assumptions, and answer the research question. The set of data which I am using today is in relation to predicting a person's brain size using their total IQ score. So IQ on the left is our independent variable, and on the right, brain size, or MRI 10K, is our dependent variable. At this point we just report on the means and the standard deviations and we're assessing whether the dependent variable on the right is normally distributed. Looking for central tendency, that is a point which peaks around the middle, which it does here. Variability, so having a wide range of variation in the scores. Skewness, slightly skewed on the right hand side but otherwise looking fairly normal. Ketosis, not too pointy or not too flat and it is by and large unimodal with one single point. So moving on to the next page after that um, we move into the bivariate statistics. Now on the left we have a scatter plot and on the right we have the Pearson's correlation table. We are looking in the scatter plot for a linear relationship between the two variables to to give us reason to conduct a linear regression. So that is to use a straight line to summarize the points. We want to, if it is linear, we want to state at this point whether we suspect a positive or a negative linear relationship. Positive being increasing, negative being decreasing. If we at this point don't actually see a linear relationship and we see some other kind of relationship, it's a good time to state that well maybe there is a curved line or some other kind of relationship. We can talk about the level of association. So the gradient, this would be a moderate, this would be an extreme association or strong rather, and this would be almost no association. However, keep in mind that association is not a standardized measure, it is dependent on the scale of the variables. Correlation, on the other hand, is a standardized measure. Um, it directly relates to the Pearson's R. The closer the Pearson's R is to plus one or minus one, the better the correlation of the two points. As you can see with the examples there, there are four different Pearson's R. The more constant the variance on either side of, of where the line of best fit is, the higher, the, the closer the R is to minus or plus one. So that example in the top left has got poor correlation because the variation changes from point to point. That's similar to the sort of variation we're getting in this graph. We look for gaps, in which case there are, we would just simply state they are between 100 and, and so and 130. They perform, they form some problem, but not a big problem. And we would also state that we might have some points that are outliers, but we're unsure at this point and nothing drastic. The Pearsons are, we can lump into a few possible categories. This time we would say it's moderate, but if it was greater than 0 0.6 or less than minus 0 0.6, we'd say it's strong. The null hypothesis of that significance level is testing whether rho or the Greek symbol for P is significantly different from zero. In this case it was, so we can say that the Pearsons R is yielding a significantly different from zero result. We then get a linear regression output which gives us these three tables in SPSS, the first being the model summary, the second being the ANOVA table, the third being the coefficients. In this top table we have the R, which is the same as Pearson's R before, and the R squared is the same as squaring that number. As you can see, the correlations table there, it's the same number. We can now take the Pearson's R value and say that 12.8% of brain size is accounted for by IQ. That's 12.8% of the DV is accounted for by the IV. We can also say that the conditional standard deviation is 6.89, um, which is the same as the standard 
standard error of estimate. Sorry, correction, that should be 6.8.4. .4. So we can now say that the standard deviation is 6.8.4. Um, moving to the next table, the ANOVA table, if we just go through this bit by bit, um, you'll notice that we've got something called the to the sums of squares on this table. The total sums of squares is if we drew a straight line where the mean of 90.8755 was and we subtracted each score from that straight line and we squared that, that would give us our total sums of squares. So this little guy down here, he would be about 12 times 12, so he would generate 144 of the total sums of squares. We then put a line of best fit through it, which is our regression line, and we measure each residual, that is the distance of each point from the line, and if we square the difference between the predicted and the observed value, and then we sum these up, we get SS residual, and SS regression is found using um, the math to find out what's left over. Degrees of freedom for the total is n minus 1, total observations minus 1, beta being the number of betas, in this case we're going to have gradient and y, and, um, y intercepts the two predicted betas in the model, that gives us our degrees of freedom there. Um, the other thing to look at in this, we've already talked about conditional um, sand deviation previously, but we'll bring it up again. Um, it's it can also be calculated as the root of mean squared error, um, or which is also the root of the the standard of the um, the regression. Sorry, the residual mean squared. It's useful um, if we look at our data and we accept the null hypothesis, which previously told us it had a mean just above 90 and a standard deviation of 7.22. As we move along this straight line, we're going to expect the points to vary on either side um, with standard deviation of 7.22. If we reject the null hypothesis um, and we think a straight line is the best situation, as we move along verbal IQ score, the variation either side of that line is going to be 6.84, um, but it will have a different mean depending on Weschler verbal IQ score. So this is the use of conditional standard deviation. We're moving from one to the other. Now, interpreting the table at the bottom, I have shown you all the values above and where to find them. Um, we're predominantly interested in writing a um, equation of a straight line that looks like dv equals y-intercept plus gradient times iv. That's the first piece of information we want to pull out. So we pull out those four different pieces of information from our table and we construct a um, sentence that looks like that MRI 10K equals 78.897 plus 0.107 times IQ. We also note that the two value, T value of 2.361 is obtained by dividing the beta by the standard error and the significance level over here um, will test for us whether or not the beta is significantly different from zero. Because remember, if the beta equals zero, there's no relationship. If the beta is not equal to zero, there is some sort of relationship going on. Um, we can also calculate a 95% confidence interval for the gradient. What do we estimate the gradient to be? And there's the formula there. In this case, we estimate the gradient. We're 95% confident the gradient ranges between 0 0.017 and 0 0.97. Uh, 0 0.197. The standardized coefficient ra uh, ranges from plus 1 to minus 1, and it's a standardized measure of the gradient, which means we can compare across different models the gradients. Um, so taking that equation, there's a bunch of stuff we can do. This is the crux of linear regression. Um, we can interpret the y-intercept by saying when IQ or the, the IV equals zero, the DV equals intercept. We can say for every one unit increase in the IV, there is a gradient increase in the DV. We can then predict from the line. So if we took the average score, for example, substituted it into the equation, we would predict their score to be 90, their, their um, MRI 10K to be 91 based on an average IQ of 113. Um, and we would also say some with an average IQ um, who's got an actual IQ of 100, um, we can predict how far away they're from the regression line, which is 8.96. We can also calculate how far, how many standard deviations their point lies from the line by dividing it by that standard, standard uh, conditional deviation. Conditional standard deviation, we can also conduct a 95% confidence interval for someone's predicted point, um, which the formula is there. It's 
um, this follows the same sort of formula as the other confidence intervals. We have to check the model, not so much in this um, particular model. Later on, this will come more apparent why we do this, but we can just state the IQs, significant predictor brain size, um, and there's a moderate relationship. There's four assumptions, independent data, linearity, normality, linearity, constant variance. Independent data, the data is drawn from a random sample. Normality of the residuals, we have two graphs that tell us that. We're looking for the histogram to be normally distributed and the points not snaking. We're looking for the Shapiro Wilk test to be greater than 0 0.05 to say there's no significant deviation from normality. In terms of linearity, we conduct a PP plot and we look for the following. We look to see that the points are randomly spattered around this graph. There's no systematic fanning from either ends. To give you an idea what that looks like, there's a graph down the bottom left. Finally, we can answer the research question, which is the last step, which IQ predicts brain size. Thank you very much. Stay tuned and we'll have more lectures coming up in the series. Thank you.